But I'd like to welcome you to the, the first workshop of, I think, uh, many. Um, in South Africa I did quite a few workshops all over the country and at the university I ran courses at the University on Paint Making. And essentially I'm going to use this book as my basis, which is obviously what I've written, the, the Found Art of Paint Making, which took me about 15 years to write. Lots of experimentation, reading a lot of books, because most books on art materials are uh, elusive. In fact, you have a look at the sponsorships, it will be like Winsor Newton or Rowney, and they actually tell people to, to drum it down, not, not to encourage people to make their own paint, mm. which is kind of not, not very good. But um, they've got away with it, and <laughs> you know, good luck to them. Um, any case, but what I'm going to try and uh, do in this particular workshop is so that you can, as an artist, develop and realize the absolute enjoyment of the alchemy of making your own paints and suddenly realizing that you don't have to buy something uh, from the shop uh, ready made, like tin food. You know, tin food sometimes can be nice and, and sort of uh, convenient. But as regards quality, you wouldn't go into a fancy restaurant and, uh, you know, if they tell you this is out of a tin, you'll be quite <laughs> disappointed. So essentially, uh, you're going to make, it's, it's like a, a cook uh, um, a program, you know, you know, where you're learning how to cook. And um, a lot of the ingredients, in fact, that we use is used in food as well. And, uh, and the thing is, it's the understanding of knowing how your materials are going to behave and to predict what it's going to do. You know, sometimes you do it and think, mm, okay. And I mean, a good thing about being an artist is that you improvise. You know, everything is about improvisation. In fact, artists that are good are generally quite smart because every time you dig yourself into a hole and find your way out again, and every single thing that you do and you make a mark, and think, mm, that's not exactly the mark I want to make, but I'll use it. And, and how you improve and how you utilize that and you remember that and you use that uh, uh, as you're going along. So essentially uh, what I'm going to give you is the tools to be able to not be at the mercy of art shops, of um, just a lack of knowledge and you know, it's like buying a machine, a sewing machine or some kind of thing and you don't read the instructions and you, know, you really get into a snarl and then you realize you can't need to read the instructions but unfortunately for artists either you have to buy a real thick book that is just everything technical or uh, you have something so simple it doesn't really tell you anything. So uh, hopefully what my book does is um, it makes it plain and simple, gives you the background and it will uh, essentially enable you to, um, yeah, as an artist develop and to be unique. Because uh, the problem with most artists, they, they buy cheaper materials, you know, you buy what they call um, students grade or um, you know, like uh, you'll get a Rowney uh, Georgian and then you get, um, I can't remember all the different names, but, but and if you look in, on the tubes, they actually say a cobalt blue, hue, H-U-E. And that actually means it's not cobalt. It actually looks like cobalt. It's just the color of cobalt. But in fact, it is an inferior pigment and it's something that is probably going to fade in a few years. But proper pigments, as you see here, are, have a 200 year life, uh, you know, even exposed in sun uh, will last, uh, is guaranteed to last for 200 years. Not that we got anyone that's going to be around, it would be nice to be around <laughs> in 200 years time, but it's the idea that you can do something quite cheaply and quality. I mean, you know, that's the whole thing that sold it to me, the idea was I can save money, it was out of desperation really that I came up with this, save money and then, okay, I'm going to go now go and explain to you about, first of all, pigments. The thing is, uh, paint is not just color. Uh, you know, people think, well, they just make a color, you know, just, you know, where do they get the color from? And essentially, a pigment is usually minerals, uh, inorganic uh, minerals, such as Iron oxides is a lot of the colors. Uh, iron oxide, you get black iron oxides, you get red iron oxide, you get yellow iron oxides like yellow ochre, uh, Mars red, and Mars black. So essentially, with those uh, pigments uh, are mineral based, such as uh, cobalt, 
is a, is a, is a metal. Uh, you have titanium, which is a metal. You have zinc. You have lead. You have all of these. Uh, you have some um, inorganic, but are synthetic, synthetic pigments, which are some of that originally were kind of discovered accidentally. Something like, um, take for example, a phthalo cyanine. I was going to find one. Let's cut it here. This, this is a, a phthalo cyanine uh, green, right, which is made from um, coal yeah, and uh, basically from fossil fuels, right? And uh, because with plastics, what they basically do, they, they heat it to a certain temperature and then you get uh, uh, forming different colors. Like, for example, your cadmiums. If you take um, a, a, a cadmium and you fire it longer, it goes to orange and then it will go to red. It will be the same, same uh, mineral, but it will change because of the uh, temperature that it's fired at, mm -hmm. right? Now, those are, you know, cadmium is obviously a natural element. But, like, for example, the, uh, the phthalo uh, cyanine uh, colors, uh, like the blue and the green, they are synthetic, okay, made uh, uh, from mineral oils as opposed to you know, coal. And, uh, um, so, uh, basically, plastics come from the same uh, source. And they're also very, very permanent, uh, in, in these colors. You get organic uh, pigments. I'll show you. Got some. Yeah. Organic pigments are extremely. Well, they're basically dyes. It's, it's like a dye. And sometimes you have to compromise for certain colors. Um, maybe. Just take it off. It's very, very lightweight. Um, and it, it can get airborne quite quickly. You can see the color oh, God, yeah. of that. Um, you can show it to the camera as well. Um, the colour of that, it's uh, yes, it's organic. It's basically made from a uh, rose meadow, mm -hmm. and same, same as alizarin crimson. Okay, so and, but they are very, very lightweight, and they're usually quite difficult to mix, especially in acrylics, um, because uh, the because of the specific gravity of the pigment. Because a lightweight pigment will just float on top of the water. The water is essentially too thick uh, for the actual uh, pigment to... Uh, it was basically like a powder and that can't mix. So what you have to do is you have to add uh, some um, uh, material, uh, which, uh, a liquid which is a dispersant, add that to the pigment. And then, you, uh, then it, it breaks down that surface tension and it, it can mix nicely. I'll give you an example of... The one where I put a dispersant um, in, the, in the acrylic, I didn't put a dispersant in there. You can see there's lumpy yeah. bits there, but I put a dispersant there and it becomes more okay. glossy. And um, that's basically the acrylic without pigment. Okay. That's just with the pigment added. I just okay. overlapped them there. You can see the difference and you get quite a nice. That's a, a could you deliberately want to have that effect? So you can, yeah, you, no, no, you, can, you can put sand you in there. Texture. You can put sand in yeah. there. You can put mm. anything, yeah, um, yeah uh, absolutely. And that's what some people do. Mm. But I wouldn't use the pigment to do that. It's a bit of a waste. Okay. Rather put something that has got... Uh, look at those. And you can see over here, I made... I didn't add any um, dispersant in there. And it's quite dead. Yeah. That, uh, that, you know, it doesn't look nice at all. And but once you add a thickener, which we will do today, and a dispersant.